We're now ready to look at the urinary system. After completing this section, you should be able to list the functions of the urinary system, list the organs involved in the urinary system and brief functions for each, describe the structure of the kidneys, describe the structure of the nephron and the functions of each part of the nephron, list the three steps of urine formation and briefly describe each step, Describe the structural characteristics of the ureters, bladder, and urethra and describe differences between the male and female anatomy of these structures. Describe the process of micturition. Describe, describe the characteristics of normal urine. List abnormal urine constituents, the name of the condition and possible causes of each. Explain how the kidneys regulate water, electrolyte, and pH levels in the blood and describe homeostatic imbalances related to the urinary system. The functions of the urinary system are basically two. One, they maintain composition of the blood. By that, they remove metabolic wastes, maintain electrolyte levels, maintain water balance, and maintain blood pH. And the second is hormone production. The kidney secretes renin, which is involved in regulating blood pressure and erythropoietin, which is responsible for red blood cell formation. Of all the systems, the urinary system is one of the simplest. The kidneys are located here in the lumbar region. These are where the nephrons are housed. These are the structures that actually form the urine. Then we have the ureters, which is the muscular tube that carries urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder. The bladder is a muscular sac that houses urine until it's convenient to eliminate it from the body. And the urethra is another muscular tube that allows for elimination of urine from the body. So the kidney is really where the action takes place. The other three parts of the urinary system are basically tubing and storage tanks for the urine until it can leave the body. The kidney is composed of millions of nephrons, and the nephrons are the site of urine production. The kidneys are retroperitoneal, that is, they are behind the peritoneum in the superior lumbar region of the abdominal cavity. They're surrounded by connective tissue and a perirenal fat capsule. Now, this fat capsule helps protect the kidney from mechanical damage, blows to the back kind of thing, as well as hold it in place. If people lose a lot of weight, they sometimes lose some of this perirenal fat, and the kidney may drop out of place. This is a condition called ptosis, which means falling. If the kidney drops out of place, it may put a kink in the ureter, and urine then cannot drain into the urinary bladder, but instead will back up in the kidney, and that's a condition called hydronephrosis. Now, since the kidney is a filtering unit, this kind of clogs the filter, stuff starts to back up, and eventually there will be waste products accumulating in the blood. If we look at a cross-section of a kidney, it looks pretty complicated. Basically, there are two major areas. There's the uh, adrenal cortex, which is this outer region, and this is where most of the nephrons are housed. And then we have the adrenal medulla. This is this center region, and the renal medulla has two areas. It has these pyramid-like areas, these little triangular areas, and a lot of the tubing of the nephron is located in here. And then you have the renal columns, which are the tissue in between the pyramids, and you'll notice that the blood vessels are in here. Now, urine is formed in the nephron, drips down through some of these renal tubules into this hollow space in the kidney. This is the pelvis of the kidney and all of the fluid that's made in the nephrons drains here into the renal pelvis and then the fluid can drain into the ureter. Now because the kidneys are a filtration system they have to have a good blood supply. Filtration, remember, uh, runs because of hydrostatic pressure, and so blood pressure is an important feature of the functioning of the kidney. About a fourth of your cardiac output travels to the kidney, so it's, it's a highly uh, vascular area. The renal artery brings blood in. It branches into sub-arteries that go up through the renal uh, column here. 
And the arteries we're going to be interested in are anything after this one. This is the arcuate artery. And this is actually the artery that divides the renal cortex from the renal medulla. Then these blood vessels that come off here are what feed the nephrons. Blood, after it's been filtered, is collected in the venous system. And ultimately, all the veins drain into the renal vein, which will return the blood back to the inferior vena cava. Let's look a little more closely at a nephron. A nephron has this little tuft of capillaries called the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is going to be surrounded by the end of a tube. This is a tube that kind of goes out and then folds back on itself. And we call this area Bowman's capsule. This is where the filtration takes place. The filtrate then has to travel so that it can be processed. And the first place it travels are this group of kind of curvy tubes right here that are called the proximal convoluted tubules because they're close to Bowman's capsule. Then we're going to dip down into the re renal uh, medulla, and here's your loop of Henle. And then we go back into some more curvy kind of tubes, and those are the distal convoluted tubules. Now they're going to feed into this collecting duct. And the collecting duct is what's going to drain the fluid that's been processed into the renal pelvis. Look at the blood supply of the nephron. The renal artery is going to bring blood into the kidney, and it's going to branch repeatedly, going branches up those uh, renal columns, until it branches into the arcuate artery. Now the arcuate artery and the arcuate vein are the dividing point between the renal cortex and the renal medulla. So the cortex is up here, the medulla is down here. The arcuate arteries travel along that borderline and periodically send branches into the cortex. This is called the cortical radiate artery. There is also a cortical radiate vein. So blood travels through the renal artery into those branches of the renal artery till we get to the arcuate artery. Travels in the arcuate artery to the cortical radiate artery. There are several branches off of the cortical radiate artery and these are the efferent arterioles. Each efferent arteriole feeds a glomerulus. Blood is drained from the glomerulus by the efferent arteriole and it branches into the capillary beds that surround all of the tubules of the nephron. These are called the peritubular capillaries. The peritubular capillaries will then lead into the cortical radiate vein, which will drain into the arcuate vein, and this will merge with other veins until eventually the blood leaves the kidney through the renal vein. So let's talk about urine formation. Urine formation is a three-step process where we filter at the glomerulus and we make a glomerular filtrate. So glomerular filtration is the first step. Then we have tubular reabsorption. And the third step is tubular secretion. In glomerular filtration, this is a passive, non-selective process. You'll remember that filtration is passive and non-selective. The driving force is the hydrostatic pressure that's in the glomerulus. Now what drives the hydrostatic pressure of the blood is blood pressure. This is why blood pressure is so important to urine formation. If you have a low blood pressure, you will not make a lot, a lot of urine. This hydrostatic pressure is going to force fluid through a filtration membrane. Anything that's dissolved in the fluid that is small enough to go through the pores in the filtration membrane will end up in the filtrate. About the only things that can't get through are protein that's in the blood and the blood cells. Pretty much everything else is the fluid and all of the things that are dissolved in the plasma of the blood. Tubular reabsorption occurs because glucose and amino acids and some other things that we need, some of those useful molecules, are in that filtrate and we need to get them back. So in the proximal convoluted tubules, we start the process of reclaiming things that we want to keep. We want the waste products to go out, but we want to keep some of this stuff back. As the filtrate is processed through the loop of Henle, we do some water adjustment. 
And then we have one last chance to sample the blood and see if there's anything that got back in the blood that we really want to get rid of. And that's what tubular secretion allows for. This allows us to actively secrete drugs. Some of the drugs that we use to treat urinary tract infections have got to get into the urine and this is where they would get in. It's also a chance to adjust some of the electrolytes and some of the hydrogen ions which control pH. So we can actively secrete potassium or actively secrete hydrogen to help adjust electrolytes and pH. This is our absolute final chance to eliminate solutes. This occurs primarily in the distal convoluted tubules so that what leaves the nephron itself, what gets into that collecting duct, is pretty much the urine that's going to go out of the body. We're not going to get a chance to manipulate it anymore after that. So if we look at it very carefully, here is the efferent arteriole feeding the glomerulus. The blood pressure in here is what forces fluid out of the blood to be collected in Bowman's capsule. Remember, this is pretty much everything in the plasma except for the proteins in the blood cells. We go into the proximal convoluted tubules, and this is where those peritubular capillaries come in so handy. We're going to have a chance to reclaim material from the proximal convoluted tubules and return it back to the blood in the peritubular capillaries. And then we have a chance in the distal convoluted tubules and a little bit in the collecting duct to actively secrete some material that may be in the blood that we really want to put in the urine. Now, interlobular veins is another uh, term for uh, cortical radiate veins. And so we have the interlobular or cortical radiate arteries and the cortical radiate or interlobar veins here. All right, let's do a little check. The part of the nephron where wastes are filtered out of the blood is the collecting duct, proximal convoluted tubule, peritubular capillaries, or the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the filtration apparatus. Not only are wastes filtered out, but also some of those useful substances, which is why we have to reabsorb from the proximal convoluted tubules. So we get back some of those substances we got rid of that we really want to keep. Reabsorption of glucose from the glomerular filtrate would occur in Bowman's capsule, the loop of Henle, the proximal convoluted tubules, or the distal convoluted tubules. That reabsorption is primarily in the proximal convoluted tubules. Bowman's capsule really just collects the filtrate and doesn't process it. The loop of Henle is where we get a chance to do some water adjustment and some electrolyte adjustment and the distal convoluted tubules are primarily where we're going to do the secretion. Well, what's really in urine? Normal urine has a pH between 4.5 and 8.0, with the average being about 6.0, so it's slightly acid. Uh, your pH of your urine will uh, vary based on diet. People who are strict vegetarians will have a more alkaline urine. They'll have a pH of 7 or possibly 8. Uh, Carnivores have the lower pH, so most of us are omnivores. We eat some meat and some veggies, so we're right in here. Specific gravity is a comparison of the weight of the urine against distilled water. And since there's always something dissolved in the urine, it has a specific gravity, even at its most dilute, of slightly more than water. Water has a specific gravity of 1.000. So somewhere between 1.001 and 1.030 is where uh, specific gravity is. If it's more concentrated than this, there's typically not enough water in it to keep the solutes dissolved. Okay, what kinds of things are normally found in urine? Well, urea is one of the waste products we want to get rid of. It's the result of protein metabolism. Sodium, potassium, phosphates, sulfates, are various things that we get rid of based on our diet, how much of this we've taken in. Creatinine is the use, uh, is a breakdown product from muscle activity that we need to excrete in the urine. And uric acid is another nitrogenous waste product from protein metabolism that we're trying to get rid of. So urea, creatine, and um, 
uric acid are the three nitrogenous waste products we primarily find in urine and the other things and other ions like calcium, magnesium, things like that will be in the urine. But the ions, these other things, are primarily based on how much you ingested of these things. Normally urine should be clear and straw to amber in color. Now the color is the result of a pigment that's produced that's called urochrome. So what kinds of things do we not want to see in urine? Well if glucose is in the urine that's a condition called glycosuria. This is commonly seen in diabetes. Albumin or protein in the urine and most of the protein in the urine is going to be albumin because that's the primary protein in blood will either be albuminuria or proteinuria. Remember that proteins are not supposed to get through the filtration membrane so if these are showing up in the urine there's been some sort of damage to the glomerular filtration membrane. Ketones or cause ketonuria and you have ketones whenever you're metabolize, metabolizing fats at a high rate. So diabetics tend to do that. So glucose and ketones in the urine would be a good indication of diabetes. Ketones only might mean starvation. If any of you have ever tried out the Adkins diet or some other high protein, low carbohydrate diet, you may have been told to check your urine for ketones. That would mean that the diet was working, that you were burning fats. You do have to be careful with that since ketones in the urine is abnormal. Putting yourself in that state is not necessarily a good thing to do for very long. Red blood cells in the urine is a condition called hematuria. Now if you have kidney stones they could be breaking capillaries in the ureters and that could cause blood to get into the urine. Uh, infections because of glomerular damage infections will have protein in the urine sometimes as well as red blood cells or if you get a good blow to the back you may pee blood for a while until the capillaries that were ruptured as a result of that damage are healed. Hemoglobin in the urine is hemoglobinuria. Now hemoglobin is inside red blood cells so conditions that cause hemoglobin in the urine typically are things that cause red blood cell breakdown inside the blood vessels so that the hemoglobin is being filtered out. Filtered out. Uh, someone who's had a transfusion reaction, they've gotten the wrong blood, they have various hemolytic anemias, or people who have burns may have hemoglobin in their urine. Bile pigments will make the urine appear sort of a strange shade of yellow because bilirubin is a yellow pigment it's the breakdown product from hemoglobin and the liver is supposed to break that down and excrete bilirubin in the feces. So if bilirubin is showing up in the urine it indicates some sort of liver problem. And white blood cells in the urine is called pyuria. Pyo means pus, so pus in the urine. This is a good indicator of infection. The ureters are the tubes that run from the kidney to the urinary bladder. They have a mucus lining, they have smooth muscle walls, and then they have connective tissue to hold them in place. Now you might think that gravity would allow urine to just simply drain from the renal pelvis into the urinary bladder, but these smooth muscles actually contract to sort of milk the urine along. People sometimes get kidney stones or renal calculi. This can result because they have a lot of calcium in their diet, or they have a lot of oxalates in their diet. Um, tea, for example, is high in oxalates. If they have a low urine production and these uh, solutes get into the kidney and they can settle out, they may turn into stones. Now what happens is when these get into the ureters, the smooth muscle contractions help push the kidney stone down into the bladder and then they can leave the body. However, this is pretty painful, this movement of these stones. Sometimes the stones are not perfectly smooth, sometimes they have some pretty rough edges. You need to pass kidney stones fairly quickly because when we talked about ptosis and hydronephrosis occurring if urine backs up into the kidney, a kidney stone can cause that to happen as well. Usually it's only on one side, so only one kidney would be affected, but 
keeping too much urine backed up in the kidney can damage it, so you want to get rid of it pretty soon. If the stone does not pass on its own, they may use ultrasounds to crush the stone, and that's a process called lithotripsy. The bladder acts as a big storage tank. It's got the same kind of structure, a mucous membrane, smooth muscle walls, and some connective tissue to hold it in place. And the urethra is how you eliminate urine from the body. Again, a mucous membrane, smooth muscle structure, and some connective tissue to hold it in place. If, because the urethra is an opening to the outside and there are bacteria that are, are on the skin around the urethral opening, that bacteria sometimes can get into the urethra where it causes urethritis. Because the entire urinary system has an opening to the outside, it has those mucous membrane linings all the way up to the kidney, and so urethritis can turn into other more significant infections. We say that these are ascending infections. The bacteria can use the mucous membrane to simply go further and further and further into the body. So urinary tract infections, UTIs, can occur. And these can be everything from cystitis, which is when the infection is pretty much confined to the urinary bladder, all the way up to pyelonephritis, where the infection actually gets into the kidney itself causing problems. Now, the urinary bladder in both the male and the female is pretty much the same. We have the ureters coming down, and the ureters actually come all the way down to the bottom and enter back here. So these are the openings for the ureters. And then the urethral opening is here. And we have this special little triangle here made by these three openings. This is called the trigone of the bladder. And this is one of the areas that's particularly sensitive to stretch. Now, the major difference between the male and the female urinary systems is the fact that the female urethra is much shorter. This means that it's a shorter distance for bacteria to travel up the urethra and get into the urinary bladder which is why women tend to have more frequent urinary tract infections. Okay. In the male, the urethra is much longer. It is encircled by the prostate gland, goes through the muscular wall, and then goes down the shaft of the penis. This longer urethra means that if bacteria try to get into the urinary bladder, it's a much longer trip. Now what happens most of the time is you're bacteria that may colonize the urethra, if you're urinating frequently, you're flushing that out with regularity. So men have a hard time getting bacteria that far up before they have urinated. Women, not so much so. The importance of the prostate encircling the urethra we'll talk about when we talk about uh, some of the causes for urinary retention. Micturition is the fancy word that means voiding. Urine is produced at a pretty constant rate by the kidneys and collects in the bladder. There are two sphincter muscles to the urethra. One is the internal urinary sphincter, which is composed of smooth muscle, which means you can't get conscious control of that one. Then there is an external urinary sphincter, which is composed of skeletal muscle. This is the one you can control. There are stretch receptors in the bladder, and they signal the brain to void whenever there's about 200 milliliters of urine in the bladder. Now, 200 milliliters is a little less than a cup. And this is a reflexive thing. We collect about a cup of urine in the bladder, and your brain gets a signal saying, okay, we could really empty if, if it's convenient. What happens, though, is that stretch receptors are susceptible to adaptation. That is, if they get the signal for a long enough period of time and nothing happens, they kind of stop sending the signal. So maybe it's not convenient to void at the moment and the brain shuts down. The urine continues to collect in the urinary bladder until you get about another cup full in there. And then you get another signal to void. Now, you can keep holding it for some long periods of time, but eventually the brain and the reflex is going to win. Uh, it will override your conscious control of the external urinary sphincter to prevent damage to the bladder. 
Incontinence is a condition where you can't control when you void. You, for some reason, you lose control of that external sphincter. Now, it takes until about age two for you to get control of the external sphincter. So prior to age two or three, somewhere in there when you're potty trained, uh, you are incontinent just because you can't control the, the sphincter. After that, one of the reasons to have incontinence issues is psychological problems. Children that do bedwetting, one of the things they think about is sexual abuse. Also, there can be nervous system problems. Uh, certainly, people who uh, are paralyzed from the waist down may be incontinent, may have difficulty uh, emptying their bladder. Other kinds of issues can occur. Women who have been pregnant will be happy to tell you that that last trimester, the baby tap dances on the urinary bladder with some regularity, putting extra pressure on the bladder. So even though it may not be very full, the baby pushing on it tends to send that override signal to the brain, and so there is some problems with incontinence there. The other side of that coin is urinary retention. This is when you are unable to void. And if it goes on long enough, catheterization is performed to make sure we don't damage the bladder. Now, urinary retention is sometimes a problem after anesthesia. If you've ever had surgery, you know that they seem very interested on whether or not you have been to the bathroom yet. And that's simply because they want to make sure you can void urine. You have regained control of that sphincter muscle as, because the anesthesia has worn off. The other problem with urinary retention is typically seen in men. As men get older, the prostate gland, and you'll remember that encircles the urethra, will tend to enlarge. It's called benign hypertrophy of the prostate, or BHP. It can enlarge to the point that it actually squeezes the urethra closed, or almost closed, making it difficult for them to void when they want to, or greatly narrowing the uh, urethra so that they don't void as extensively as they should. In severe cases, they will go in and remove some of the prostate tissue to open up the uh, urethra. All right, the kidney helps control blood composition. That's one of the things it does. And your blood composition is dependent upon your diet because things from the digestive system end up in your bloodstream your cellular metabolism because how you metabolize those nutrients determine what waste products are in your bloodstream and then on your urine output because your urine is a filtrate of the plasma removing those metabolic waste products and removing extra things that you may have ingested in your diet like extra sodium or potassium so that the blood composition the fact that what the kidney does to the blood depends upon the excretion of the nitrogenous wastes, the balance of water, balancing electrolytes, and balancing the pH of the blood. As we look at each one of these, the excretion of nitrogenous waste we pretty much already talked about. These are the result of protein metabolism, and these are your urea, your uric acid, and your creatinine. These things are filtered out in the glomerulus. They are not reabsorbed should they accidentally passively move back into the blood in the proximal convoluted tubules. They will be actively secreted uh, in the distal convoluted tubules. So we pretty much talked about that one. But the balance of pH, electrolytes, and water we still need to discuss. Now your body is about half water by body weight. This will vary based on age, gender, body fat, and body fat content. Uh, the younger you are, the more water. Uh, men have more water than women. And the more body fat you have, the less water you have. Now, your water, your body fluids, are divided into two compartments. We have the intracellular fluid, which is all the fluid inside the cells. And we have the extracellular fluid, which is all the fluid outside the cells. So if we pretend that you're a big rectangle, <laughs> You've got all of this fluid that's inside your cells, and about 40% of your body weight is made up of that fluid. And then you've got your extracellular fluid out here, which is that fluid that surrounds your tissues, the interstitial fluid, and the blood plasma. 
Now, this kind of fluid we can't get at. We can't do much with this. But this is the fluid that the interstitial fluid plays a role on the plasma composition. Intracellular fluid plays a role on the composition of interstitial fluid. And the kidneys can adjust things that are in the plasma. So we can go from the plasma to the interstitial fluid to the cell fluid or things that are in the cell fluid get into the interstitial fluid and get into the blood and then the kidneys can adjust that. So that if we look at this, you know, the blood plasma changes oxygen and CO2 content depending on, because it gets it from the lungs and puts it in the interstitial fluid and the cells give it back out. Things that you have in, put in your digestive system, nutrients and various ions, go into the cell, waste products come out, and it's your kidneys that can adjust your blood. So if we adjust the blood, we help control the intracellular fluid, or the interstitial fluid, and the intracellular fluid. And this is how the kidneys can work to maintain all of this balance in the body. Now it's really hard to talk about water balance without talking about electrolyte balance pretty much at the same time because the two go hand in hand. That intracellular fluid and that extracellular fluid have to stay the same concentration of ions. The exact ions in each will vary, but the concentration has to remain the same. And sodium is the major ion that is controlled by the kidneys and water follows sodium. So if we're excreting sodium in the urine, we're going to excrete some water with it. If we're saving sodium from the filtrate back into the blood, we're going to have some water follow it back. But we've got to keep the water and the electrolytes balanced between the ICF and the ECF. Now, just ingestion of water, just looking at water balance, what comes in has got to go out. That's just the rule, otherwise you're going to have problems. Now our sources of water is when we break down food, we make a little bit of water. Uh, foods are not totally dry, there's some water in them. And then of course we ingest water and other beverages. In terms of output, a little bit goes out in the feces. You sweat a little bit every day, no matter, even if you don't think you're working very hard. And you lose some water just through the moisture of your skin and the moisture of your breath. But the vast majority of water output is urine. Now here they're showing about um, 2,500 milliliters of water in and 2,500 milliliters of water out. But this is going to vary greatly from person to person depending on diet and how much you drink. But basically input has to equal output. Now thirst is our driving force for water intake. And thirst is actually driven by the concentration of our plasma and by our plasma volume. If we have a low plasma volume, that's low blood pressure, we get some things going on and the kidney is involved in this that tell our hypothalamic thirst center that Ooh, we need some fluid because we've got to get the blood pressure back up. The other thing is the concentration of your plasma. If your plasma is too concentrated, we also stimulate osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, and these are ones that pay attention to the concentration of the plasma, which stimulate thirst. And the fact that if your plasma is kind of super concentrated, you don't make much saliva and your mouth feels dry, and that's another thing. So you have this thirst sensation based on concentration of your plasma and your plasma volume and you drink and that helps moisten the throat so you sort of lose some of that sensation. You get water absorbed in the get through, through the GI tract and that changes the concentration of your plasma and so you're a happy camper once again. Now as we look at how the kidneys control electrolytes and water, we're going to look at some hormones and we've talked about these before. Antidiuretic hormone, which you'll remember comes from the pituitary gland, acts on the distal convoluted tubules. Now if ADH is being secreted, it's going to tell the body to pull water back out of the urine filtrate into the blood. So ADH is going to be secreted whenever you're kind of concentrated, your plasma is concentrated. 
so you're dehydrated so that you save water back. People who do not have an adequate amount of ADH will not be able to control the water in their filtrate and we call this condition diabetes insipidus. The other hormone that plays a role in blood concentration is aldosterone. Aldosterone causes the conservation of uh, sodium. Now again, this one is based on blood pressure, not on sodium levels, but on blood pressure. If blood pressure is being decreased, you've got a low blood volume. So aldosterone will act on the distal convoluted tubules, making them save back more sodium out of the filtrate. Water follows the sodium, so that sodium goes back in the blood, the water goes back into the blood, and you're going to increase blood volume, which will help increase blood pressure. Now, whenever you're saving sodium, because they're a positive ion, you've got to keep all those positives and negatives balanced, so you save some chloride, but you've also got to get rid of some positive ions if you're saving positive ions, so you dump potassium. So when we control sodium, not only do we control water, but we also indirectly control some of the other ions in the body. Now one of the most important triggers for aldosterone is the renin-angiotensin mechanism. Renin is secreted by the kidney cells whenever there is low blood pressure. And it makes sense that the kidneys would be sensitive to blood pressure. Remember, the whole filtration operation is managed because of hydrostatic pressure or blood pressure. So low blood pressure, you're going to have a low filtration rate. You're not going to make much urine. And with a low filtration rate, you will not be clearing waste products effectively from the blood. So the kidneys have cells that are very susceptible to blood pressure, and they secrete the hormone renin. Now, renin causes angiotensin II to be produced. We talked about this in the um, cardiovascular system. And angiotensin II does two things. First of all, it will vasoconstrict to help drive blood pressure up, but it also causes the release of aldosterone, and we just saw how, how aldosterone increases blood pressure by saving sodium, causing water to be saved, increasing blood volume to get that increased blood pressure. So here is your falling systemic blood pressure and some of the things that happen. Because you've reduced filtrate volume, your kidneys begin to release renin. Renin causes vasoconstriction, which increases peripheral dis resistance to drive blood pressure up, but it also stimulates the production of aldosterone. Aldosterone causes sodium and water retention, which increases blood volume, and we have raising blood pressure, which is what we wanted. Some of the other things that happens, because the blood vessels or the blood pressure is falling, the sympathetic nervous system gets involved, it will also trigger the kidney to release renin. It will cause the vasoconstriction of arterioles to increase peripheral resistance, again, rising blood pressure. And falling blood pressure, those hypothalamic osmoreceptors may pay attention to the fact that we're a little uh, too concentrated. We'll get antidiuretic hormone, which will increase water absorption, again increasing blood volume, which increases blood pressure. But notice, this is driven by blood pressure, not by sodium levels, not by anything else, but by blood pressure, showing you how important blood pressure is on the effects of the kidneys. Now that kind of gives you a water and electrolyte balance. How do the kidneys control pH? Well, your blood normally should have a pH between 7.35 and 7.45. If it is below 7.35, we say that you have physiological acidosis. The blood is still a little alkaline, but it's more um, acid than it should be, so it's physiological acidosis. And if it's above, above 7.45, we say it's alkalosis, again, physiological. Now, we have lots of challenges to our pH during the day, and this kind of fluctuation could occur pretty easily. But your body has a system of buffers. Now, a buffer is simply a chemical that helps prevent change in pH. It acts as a hydrogen ion sponge. 
and you'll remember the number of hydrogen ions in a solution determine how acidic it is. When you put acids in solution, they kind of break apart and you get your component ions. So hydrochloric acid totally dissociates. Every last molecule breaks apart and so for each molecule of hydrochloric acid you put into a solution, you get a hydrogen ion. Carbonic acid, on the other hand, does not completely dissociate. It comes apart a little bit and you get a few hydrogen ions, but some of the molecules stay together as carbonic acid molecules. And it's only acid because of its ability to contribute hydrogen ions to a solution. There are three buffer systems in the body. One is the proteins that are inside the cells. That takes care of buffering little changes that occur in pH as a result of cellular metabolism in the cell. Phosphates are an important buffering system in the urine. But the one we're really interested in is the bicarbonate buffer system because this is the one that helps maintain blood pH. The bicarbonate buffer system works because whenever we have water and carbon dioxide mixed together with the right enzyme, we get some of that carbonic acid. And carbonic acid breaks down a little bit to some hydrogen ions and some bicarbonate ions. Some of them stay as carbonic acid ions. The lungs control how much carbon dioxide is in our blood. So remember, when we exchange uh, oxygen for carbon dioxide at the tissue level, we're going to have more carbon dioxide in our blood, which could make it a little bit acidic because we'd be putting some hydrogen ions into solution. The kidneys control this end of this equation. They can actively secrete hydrogen ions or they can manufacture bicarbonate ions to contribute to the blood. So they control blood pH by helping us dump either acid hydrogen ions or bicarbonate ions. Because it's important to maintain blood pH, this buffer system helps us do this. However, buffer systems are a lot like sponges. This, this particular mo molecule can pick up some hydrogen ions or give them up, either way, so it can act as a sponge. But just like any sponge, it beca can become saturated and it can't do any more than that little bit. So whenever we have challenges to pH, we have our lungs and our kidneys to help us out. Now if we have metabolic problems, some sort of metabolic process is going on, and the kidneys can't secrete enough bicarbonate or hydrogen ions, the lungs will kick in and help us maintain blood pH. Uh, how would we get metabolic alkalosis or metabolic problems? Well, if we ingest alkaline substances and a number of drugs are alkaline, that could put too much alkali into the blood and the kidneys might not could secrete all of it fast enough. If we make metabolic acids, for example, diabetics make those ketones, ketones are acidic. So diabetics have a problem with the condition of acidosis. Again, the kidneys may not can dump enough hydrogen ions in the urine to balance the pH. And so the lungs can, we can alter how we breathe either retaining carbon dioxide or getting rid of carbon dioxide to help out that buffer system a little bit. Respiratory problems can cause the kidneys to help correct the pH. Now here, if people hyperventilate, they get rid of more CO2 than they should. The kidneys have to save back hydrogen ions. If they hypoventilate, then they retain too much CO2, the blood gets too acidic, and the kidneys can help out by dumping some of those extra hydrogen ions. Fevers, for example, make people hyperventilate. Pneumonias make them hypoventilate, even though they're breathing because of the blockage of some of the alveoli with mucus and other things, they can't get oxygen to their, and, uh, into the bloodstream and they can't get rid of the carbon dioxide they need to get rid of. So, this is how the kidneys help control pH through regulating hydrogen and bicarbonate ions and they do this primarily at the distal convoluted tubules. Alright, so what are some of the developmental problems of the kidney? Well, one is polycystic kidneys. 
Here, the nephrons don't filter like they're supposed to, and fluid collects in them so that you have these cyst-like structures. Because the uh, nephrons are not functional, you don't have good urine production. This tends to be progressive damage, and the treatment is kidney transplants. Now, there is a very severe form of this where the child is born with a number of cysts on the kidney, and the kidney is already pretty non-functional. They need a transplant fairly early in life. There is a less damaging part of this where the cysts produce very slowly, and people may be in their 40s or 50s before they have any clinical symptoms of polycystic kidney disease. Hypospadias is a problem you can see in men. The urethral opening is not at the end of the penis where it should be, but somewhere along the side. Usually this is surgically corrected sometime in the first 12 months of life. Glomerulonephritis is a condition that occurs sometimes as a result of streptococcal infections. People have strep throat. What they do is they get these large antigen antibody complexes that damage the glomerulus. Uh, so that protein and blood show up in the urine, but no bacteria. Um, you, sometimes this will repair on its own. Sometimes it is permanent damage. As we age, the kidneys decrease in size and also in function. This may partially be because of atherosclerosis and reduced circulation, since circulation is very important for the kidneys to function. There are also problems with urgency and frequency. Even a small amount of urine in the bladder gives the feeling that you need to void, and as that result, you tend to go to the bathroom more frequently and void very small amounts of urine. This becomes a problem at night when you have something called nocturia. You can't sleep through the night because the need to void wakes you up, and you go to the bathroom, and you void just a little bit, and then you go back to sleep. This can happen two or three times during the night without you know, being at all uncommon in older people. This is not to be confused with bedwetting. Bedwetting is when you fail to wake up and urinate. With nocturia, you're being, waked, you're be being awoken and you're going to the bathroom appropriately. And of course, in men, uh, urinary retention as a result of benign hypertrophy of the prostate is fairly common. The renin-angiotensin mechanism leads to the production of ADH, aldosterone, bicarbonate, or all of the above. This mechanism is the most powerful way to get aldosterone. And of course, the renin-angiotensin mechanism is stimulated by low blood pressure, and aldosterone helps increase blood volume by retaining sodium out of the urinary filtrate. Low blood pressure would result in an increased urine output, dehydration, a decreased urine output, or all of the above. Blood pressure drives that hydrostatic filtration mechanism. If it is too low, you will have decreased urinary output.